Greta is our spot to chill pregame, postgame, and all through the offseason as well. Let it be yours. Pregame, postgame. Like I said, 10-minute walk from Rogers Arena, folks. Check out Greta Bar YVR today. Let's bring him in. The man, the myth, the legend, Jeff Patterson, who today had a really funny, I had a really funny interaction with J Pat today. Because I don't usually go to morning, I don't usually go to Rogers Arena. Okay. But I went to morning skate today, and Jeff was supposed to be there, and he was there. But I, I didn't see him in the media pool, and I was like, Anybody seen Jeff around? And he was up in the press box doing a hit with Scarce Rice, like he is with us right now. Um, and I was like, I was just making sure Jeff didn't, yeah, quads, I'll be there, and then just not show up. Jeff, you would never do that. Uh, no, pretty responsible. Uh, <laughs> that is one thing I can hang my hat on. Uh, but I, you're right. Like, I didn't expect you because normally you would text me and say, hey, I'm going to be at practice as well. So uh, finished up with Scarce Price, raced downstairs, was worried that maybe I'd missed something. And Sure enough, I had. I had missed Casey DeSmith's scrum, but uh, there was Dave. He was on it. He had the audio for me. Teamwork. Uh, that's how it uh, is supposed to work. So, uh, yes, but it was a surprise quad sighting in the Canucks locker room this morning. Not much of a surprise sighting today. Uh, Archer Seelovs gets the call up. Uh, what do you make of that decision? Like, I, I, Did you have a hard take if it should have been Seelovs or Tolapila? We didn't talk to you before that. I think I expected it to be, I think you have to consider that Arthur Silovs and his five NHL games all came under Rick Tockett last year. So not that this was Tockett's decision, but he's the head coach. The buck stops with him if he has to make a goaltending decision at some point. Obviously, he would lean heavily on Ian Clark, and I'm sure the organization did to make this decision. But uh, Tockett has seen Silovs. Uh, he would have seen Tolapilo uh, at training camp, and I suppose if he's made his way out to Abbotsford, I'm not sure if he has made his way out to Abbotsford this year uh, to take in any games, but I guess I just thought that those five games last year, and five games, guys, where he, he didn't look out of place, and I think you remember, too, uh, this was when they basically were at wit's end as an organization that uh, Spencer Martin and Colin Dealey just weren't getting it done, and they thought, why not? We've got nothing to lose, essentially, at this point. Let's bring the guy up from the minors and give him a chance his debut against the New York Rangers and yeah he looked a little bit nervous in that one as you can understand but I thought he got better to the point where he like he faced the Boston Bruins think about the season that the Bruins had last year and maybe they should have left him in the entire game because Linus Allmark ended up scoring the empty netter that night uh but uh, I thought Silovs handled himself against uh, an absolute wagon in, in the Boston Bruins and the other games that he played like he didn't look out of place so I know it's been a bit of a spotty season for him in Abbotsford this year but I guess I figured that those five games of experience at this level probably would be the determining factor. So I wasn't surprised that he was the one that got the call. Jay Pat, the Canucks have recently beat LA, Vegas, Winnipeg. Has that given you confidence that the Canucks can hang against some of these top Western Conference contenders come playoff time? The way they played on Saturday, Harm, that first period, like I don't care who it was. I don't care if the Jets had had the night off the night before. Uh, the Canucks just looked absolutely so determined in that first period to stuff it to Winnipeg and not give them a sniff. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots to like right now. Uh, the fact that Carson Soucy is back, I think, has been a huge help. Uh, just quietly goes about his business, but he makes them better. And look, how many times have we heard Rick talk at Harp about the stupid stick penalties that uh, they were taking way too many coming out of the All-Star break? They were the most penalized team for the first couple of weeks <clears throat> after the All-Star break. They have been shorthanded once in each of these four wins on the win streak. And go back to Vegas, Connor Garland got a penalty for putting his hand on Shea Theodore's shoulder. <laughs> and then Brock Besser the other night, a little bit of a flyby in the third period of garbage time. Uh, like So even the penalties that they're taking aren't, you know, the questionable penalties at that, uh, whether they should have been called. So there's been terrific discipline. And Talkin has said, like, when I guys stay out of the penalty box, A, I'm not leaning on six forwards to do the heavy lifting of penalty killing. But beyond that, can roll all four lines, can get guys into the games. Players aren't sitting on the bench for long stretches. And I thought you saw that in the first period where a ton of short shifts, just pouncing on the Jets, shift after shift, stacking those shifts as they love to do, and just so responsibly in their own zone, breaking the box out to transition so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anybody could look at this past week. And I don't know about you guys, but like I still had people in my mentions saying, oh, but who have they beaten? Like there's nobody that can say that now when you look at the way that they figured things out, sort of the Rubik's Cube against the Los Angeles Kings. First 20 minutes, not great, but they they made some adjustments. Harm, you were there at Crypto.com to watch it yourself. and But on TV even, once they sorted it out, like they were so clearly the better team against the Kings. They follow that up. They were the better team against Vegas and here against Winnipeg as impressive as they've been in a while. So 
when they're on and playing that way, if they can get their star goalie completely healthy and rested up and ready to go for the playoffs, then yeah. I mean, I think this past week has sort of renewed this notion that they didn't have to add at the trade deadline, that they got to first place in the Western Conference with this roster that they had. And when this team is playing the way Rick Tockett wants it to, sticking to those staples, uh, they look like they can be a formidable foe. They are playing to those staples right now. Uh, after practice today, Jeff, you and I were both there. Uh, Rick Tockett said he has no concerns if Thatcher Demko is going to be back in time for playoffs. He thinks that's going to happen. Uh, we're hearing two to four weeks for Demko with a knee injury. Uh, Rick Tockett admitting that the injury was a lower body injury and that it he didn't deny that it started with a K and ended with an E. But um, Rick Tockett saying to, that it's going to be a bit for Demko, but not worried about playoffs. With how this team's playing, how confident are you in their ability to you know, still string together some wins here with the Smith or Seelovs in net? Yeah, I, again, if they can bottle up what they've had here over the last four games, uh, I think that absolutely. Like now, Colorado is going to be a test. I know that the Abs are in Calgary tonight. And so, yes, they're getting another team on back to backs. This is where the schedule absolutely plays in the Canucks' favor, but it's Nathan McKinnon, it's Kale McCarr. Like the Avs are going to be a handful for the Vancouver Canucks. So, Massive test for Casey DeSmith. But again, if this team can stick to its staples and defend the way they did against the Winnipeg Jets, then I think DeSmith is up to the challenge. And then a bunch of more days off. And then you get a Washington team that, you know, doesn't seem to know where it's going these days. But the Canucks, uh, again, if they play the way they are capable of, they should be able to handle the Capitals, the Sabres, the Montreal Canadiens, even the Calgary Flames when you look at what's coming. Now, I thought it was interesting. Talk it said, DeSmith's going to start the next two, and then they will sort of reassess where he is and where the hockey club is. Wouldn't commit to an Arthur Silov start on this call-up. So it is Casey DeSmith's net. And I think it was really important that he got that win in Anaheim. Uh, you know, he hadn't played since being shelled for eight. And obviously they lost 10-7 in Minnesota. He didn't give up the last couple. But, you know, he had to sleep on that for a couple of weeks. And it was the Ducks, but it was the start of a road trip. They had just been throttled by the LA Kings. Like, I think that was an important game. And he gave up an early one, a bit of a strange bounce. Like, I thought that might have, you know, rattled him a little bit. But uh, he made the saves that he was supposed to. And then even the other night, I mean, 33 minutes of relief duty uh, against the Jets team that wasn't out of it, although they didn't look all that into it either. But his job as a goaltender is to stop pucks, and that's what he did. He stopped all the 10 shots that came his way. So, you know, I think he can build off 93 minutes of uh, hockey in which he's given up one kind of fluky goal to the Ducks early in that hockey game, and hopefully he can build on that and be ready for the challenge here. But again, the schedule works so well that, you know, a Wednesday game and then a Saturday game and then a Tuesday game, uh, lots of time to work with Ian Clark between the starts to – uh, get the rest that he needs, but also to drill down on whatever he wants to sharpen in his game. So, uh, yeah, where they are, uh, and Harm, I heard you talking about it yesterday. I think uh, we're really, like, the stakes aren't all that significant now for the Vancouver Canucks. Like, they've done the heavy lifting to get to this point. You can't pick your playoff opponent, and, you know, if they get Nashville in the first round, the Preds are going good. If they get Vegas in the first round, you get in the Stanley Cup champs. I mean, however it all plays out, uh, it really doesn't matter all that much if there are a couple of speed wobbles here along the way, that they're going to the playoffs, they're going to get a tough opponent. It certainly looks like they're going to have home ice in the opening round. And so I just think that, you know, it's all about trying to build on what they've done on this win streak. And if they do that, then I think Casey DeSmith stands every reason to be able to perform and deliver victories for the Vancouver Canucks. j Pat, do you think... <clears throat> excuse me, do you think Elias Lindholm's game is starting to trend in the right direction? I, I was quietly impressed with his last couple of performances. There's been a lot of things to like in his game. I, I guess he came with, and I don't want to say it's unfair because, I mean, the numbers are what the numbers are, but like he's not a 40 point 80 or 40 goal 80 point guy. Like he had that season. He's had two big seasons offensively in his NHL career. But if you look at the other years, they're sort of in that high 40s, low 50s kind of point totals. And I think that's really more of who he is. And then you add that to the face-offs and you add it to penalty killing utility and late game protecting leads and some of those things. Like Rick Tockett was raving about him today and said, like, if he continues to do what he's doing, the building blocks are there that, sure, there's going to be some offense. Like, think about how many different line mates he had early on after the trade to the point that, 
you know, they had Archdeep Baines playing with him. And look, Archdeep was trying to find his level in the National Hockey League for the first time. But, you know, he looked a little, I don't know, frightened, the right, reluctant to make plays, you know, just trying to make the safe play. And here you've got Lindholm who's trying to settle in with a new team and he's got a, a raw rookie getting his first taste of the National Hockey League. Now he's got Pod Colson on his wing, but Pod's looked pretty good, I think, in the four games that he's played so far. And they were back at practice today. So I would assume that that'll be a line you see with Garland uh, going up against Colorado. So, yeah, I, I think, would you like a little more production? Sure. But I, I, this team scores enough goals. Like when the other guys are doing what they do, you know, they don't need Elias Lindholm scoring Two goals a night, it is kind of funny that the games that he has scored, uh, there have been multiple goals. But uh, I think it's more those little things that coaches truly appreciate. And just listening to Rick Tockett today, uh, you know, he seemed to give Elias Lindholm uh, far better than a passing grade for his time here with the Vancouver Canucks. And, and he pointed to, you know, late in the Los Angeles game in a tight hockey game that, you know, you lose a faceoff might wind up in the back of your net, but they've got full confidence and his face-off numbers are through the roof and so are the other centermen. And I think that's a byproduct that it's taken some of the pressure off Elias Pedersen and JT Miller in some certain situations that they know they've got this ace in the hole right now, a guy that's winning 60% of his draws. So, um, you know, it hasn't been flashy, but I think now this team is starting to move back in the right direction. People can understand that, uh, you know, he is a part that's going to help them, uh, but he's probably not going to be the first star on a lot of nights. That That's just not who he is. But I think uh, kind of subtly he checks off a lot of boxes for the Vancouver Canucks. Jeff, I don't want to just ask you, is this player playing well? How well is this player playing? Because like Vasily Pankholz and Ilya Mikheyev, we started to see some real, you know, it feels like turning point for Mikheyev at least. What I want to ask you is, this is something Harmon and I were talking about right before we went to air, was when Dakota Joshua gets back, who comes out of the lineup? Like, mm -hmm. it, it feels mean to come up with an answer, but you have to come up with an answer. And again, I know this might be a question that's better suited for next week because by all indications, uh, Josh was not coming back anytime soon. Who, who's the guy that comes out? Well, coaches, first of all, they love these types of decisions, right? Because uh, they're difficult decisions. And it, you know, if you'd asked me last week, I would have said, Phil, did you just happy, hands down. And then Phil, the thrill... Uh, who needs Phil Kessel? You got Phil D. Giuseppe. Uh, scored in back-to-back -back games. Like, where's that come from after going 29 without? Um, you know, but I, I think it does. It puts some internal pressure on all those guys in the fourth line. And Ilya Mikheyev is not out of the woods right now, but there has been an uptick in his play. I, 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 we can agree on that. The bar was pretty low. And so I don't want to uh, go overboard with praise, but I do think that he was doing – you know, the things that he has to do, get in on the four check, try to turn some pucks over so that JT and, and Brock Besser can go to work in the offensive zone, be disruptive in the neutral zone. McCann rarely hurts you, but he hasn't necessarily been helping either. So, I mean, hopefully he has something to build on here. Yeah, the other thing too is uh, there's no guarantees, right? Like Dakota Joshua comes back, uh, the decision may be made for Rick Tockett. Like, you know, they've been very fortunate with injuries all season long. So let's see where I'm always loath to, to sort of get too far ahead of myself and say, oh, well, when Dakota Joshua comes back, yeah, but somebody, it's pro sports, it's a contact sport. Somebody else could come out of the lineup. But I thought it was really interesting today too, Farhan Lulji asked Rick Tockett about load management for the defenseman. And, you know, his eyes kind of lit up and, and absolutely he agreed that that's something that they want to do with the defense core. And we saw it briefly in the middle of that uh, trip through New Jersey and New York and, and Pittsburgh when they had all of the guys available. Now, you know, Susie's been out and Tyler Myers has missed the last four games, so they haven't had that luxury. But, boy, it sounded like you are going to see some load management over the final 15 games whenever Myers gets the green light to get back in there. So it might be some of that as well. That uh, I mean, go back to training camp and we heard all about you know committees, defense by committee and scoring by committee. Uh, we may see the committee approach, and I think, uh, as Tockett said today, he knows that guys aren't going to be happy when the coaches tell them that they're going to have to sit for a game here or a game there, but they have to understand that it's a team-first concept. And so, as much as he was talking about the defense, I think some of that can apply to that forward group as well. It was a Western Conference arms race at the trade deadline last week. We've obviously spent a lot of time discussing what Vegas has done, the whole hockey world has, but outside of Vegas – which Western Conference contender do you think improved the most? Yeah, I I guess, like, I already like Colorado. Um, and I thought 
you know, some interesting moves there to part with Bo and Byram, certainly. But some of that, I think, was trying to shore up the, the right side of their defense. And, you know, when you have the depth that they did and the, the riches, they were able to, to sort of part with some of that and trying to identify that, you know, second, second line center. Ryan Johansson just never was the answer, even though he scored a couple of goals uh, the last time the Canucks saw them. So, uh, you know, that's a good team that I think was really sort of laser focused on what it want. It wasn't just trying to assemble bodies and, and sort of hope that they could figure things out. I mean, they had a plan uh, going into the trade deadline and, you know, we'll see how it works out with Casey Middlestad. Uh, but I like the addition of Sean Walker. I mean, I kind of figured he was going to wind up somewhere. And as uh, the dominoes started to fall, you kind of got the feeling that it probably would be in the West just because everybody was trying to do what they do. You know, if the Winnipeg Jets getting Tyler to Foley, like that would have been a seamless fit here, obviously. And, and as the price was revealed and then the retention as well, like I think there were a lot of Canuck fans that thought this is nuts. Like how could the Canucks not make that deal? But, uh, you know, that's a nice pickup, obviously, for the Winnipeg Jets. So good teams got better. And I think uh, for the Vancouver Canucks, they just have to recognize that, uh, you know, they've kind of incrementally been going about uh, adding pieces throughout the season. Yeah, it was a little disappointing on Friday. Certainly in this business, we love things to, to talk about and trades get people talking. But uh, we heard from Patrick Elvine the reasons behind uh, the decision not to go all in. They keep their assets. And I think getting Elias Patterson done uh, the week before, you know, really allowed the Canucks to recognize that they're a good team this year. Their star players have leveled up. They're going to go into the playoffs and take their best swing. But I think now that they have certainty on Elias Pettersson in the future, they recognize that there is a window here, certainly the next couple of years with Demko and Hughes at the price points that, that they're at. Uh, Jeff, right before you came on, I'm not sure if you've seen it, so I hate to put it on the spot if you haven't seen it, but extensions for Cammy Grano, Emily Castonge, uh, and Ryan Johnson got promoted to assistant general manager from assistant to the general manager. <laughs> um, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I, I did catch that, and I agreed with you guys that, I mean, alignment from top to bottom has been one of the real sort of cornerstones for this franchise turning the corner from where they were. And so I think you have to see it as good news. You know, Ryan Johnson's universally liked in this business, I think, uh, by the hockey side of uh, the league, but certainly people in the media uh, have a lot of time and respect for, for RJ as well and, and did when he was a player. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess when Derek Clancy elected to move on, uh, at, you know, last offseason, I, I wondered. I just thought, like, it looked like the Canucks were building and, putting things in place and I thought and that's curious that Derek Clancy uh you know not even two years after being the first hire by Jim Rutherford he elected to leave and I, I wasn't sure if that was going to uh start a, an exodus I just didn't know but uh clearly it didn't and so they've been able to retain uh, you know good people diverse front office obviously that was what they set out to do and and I think they've accomplished that uh obviously the results speak for themselves with the way this team has played but I just think uh the alignment is the big thing. And, uh, you know, so often in today's world, there are a lot of buzzwords and, you know, alignment. Yeah, it sounds great. Every team should want alignment, but I think there is truly uh, from the top down here, you know, collaborative efforts uh, in the front office, but they involve the coaching staff. Uh, you know, I think the players understand what's being done here to try to make this organization better and I think the players, for the most part, feel pretty good and comfortable in their surroundings here. And so uh, instead of the off-ice drama that's plagued this organization for the better part of a decade now, uh, you know, the noise and the volume level has just been brought down uh, almost to nothing. And as a result, everybody's free to go about their business and just do their jobs, do them to the best of their ability, and that includes the players. And, uh, you know, it's impossible to argue with the success that they've put on the ice. And I do think that a lot of that comes just from the stability, finally, that they have in this organization. So getting everybody in the front office uh, locked up and under contract uh, can only be seen as a good thing for the Vancouver Canucks. Last week in L.A., the Canucks were practicing, and as they were practicing, I saw Patrick Alvin and Philip Pronick's agent, Alan Walsh, having some conversations. And I believe since then there have been reports that the Canucks have tabled uh, some type of uh, contract offer to him, when you think about Hironik's next contract, uh, how strongly do you feel that the cap hit for his next deal needs to come in below uh, Hughes's, I believe, $7.85 million AAV? 
Yeah, I mean, on, on the surface, Harvey, like it's impossible to imagine that a teammate playing the same position could get more than Quinn Hughes, but we understand the economics and the way the market works, and Quinn Hughes right now is one of the best value contracts in the National Hockey League, uh, given the amount that he plays, the fact he wears a C, uh, his production, and all that kind of stuff, and he's going to get paid in his next deal. So you'd like to have an internal salary cap, I don't know. I mean, a right shot defenseman putting up the points, playing the minutes, you know, at the age that Philip Peronik is, uh, he's going to be able to command a fair bit. And so I, as much as it sounds crazy to think that Philip Peronik could be making more than Quinn Hughes for the next couple of seasons, I think it's going to be tough for the Canucks to, to make that fly and keep that number under uh, Quinn Hughes' salary. So we'll see where it goes. Would love to know, I mean, wouldn't we all, uh, you know, an initial contract offer. I would imagine that you start low and and sort of negotiate from there. But uh, yeah, it's going to be fascinating, but at least they've got the uh, cost certainty of Elias Pettersson. That was the big domino. And I don't know what's going on here. But <laughs> <laughs> They're doing audio tests. They're getting ready for tomorrow's yeah, layoffs. Well, I feel like ready. Yeah, we got where the streets have no name. I feel like the players are going to come filing back out onto the ice a couple hours after practice. So uh, yeah. You never uh, know what you get. You hang around Rogers Arena <laughs> long enough into the afternoon, you never know what you're going to get here at the ring. I'm just waiting for them to test the goal horn in the middle of one of your <laughs> answers, just that fairy horn. Uh, we'll wrap it up there, Jeff. But tomorrow, it's Colorado, Vancouver. Who is on rink wide with you tomorrow night? Uh, you know what? It's been a couple of days off. I have uh, left the hockey world uh, behind for these last couple of days, uh, ventured up to Whistler. I don't even know. I'm going to have to go and find out. Uh, <laughs> no if it's problem. Not, if it's neither one of you guys... <laughs> Uh, and I'm assuming from the question that it's not one of you. Well, uh, it was Farhan <laughs> on the weekend. Eh, it might be time to get her back into the mix. We'll see. But I'll have a co-host. That much I know. Uh, and looking forward to it. I, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, you know this two-day break. Will rest serve the Canucks well? Uh, Casey the Smith, obviously. And I just love watching Nathan McKinnon do his thing. And it's the only visit of the season, at least the regular season, from the Colorado Avalanche. So uh, it should be fun. Jeff, as, start tomorrow night. As we've learned in previous times on this show it might be me even though i asked you your co-host, it, it very well might be me uh jeff thanks so much for doing this we really appreciate it all right guys thanks there he is jeff patterson who as i mentioned you can find on rink wide vancouver after every single canucks game jeff does a great job i do a great job when i'm on that show it might be tomorrow i don't know um, but yeah, it's funny. I actually started panicking for a second. I was like, oh, I don't, I didn't write down any dates. Yeah. I, I have one. I, I, I have, I try to write it down. Obviously. Yeah. Saturday. I'm on, I'm on rink wide Saturday with Jeff Washington at Vancouver. I'm at that game, but you know, seven 30 tomorrow. I think I have to go to the game. Wyatt told me he, I know, I know. Oh, no, gives, you have to I go know, to the game. Everybody gives oh, no. me a hard time. Such I just, a tough life. I just don't like taking the Sky Train, you know, like at 1230 by the time I get out of there. Anyways. Oh, boohoo. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Let me get like me. the world's smallest violin for you. <laughs> I know. Every time I bring it up, I'm always like, well, especially people listening to this show, they would kill for the opportunity to go to every game for free. And I get it. And then go talk to the players. I get it. I get it. Anyways, okay. Count your blessings. Yeah, dude. count Come my blessings. On. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Patterson. Uh, Jeff, that was Jeff Patterson, who will also be at the game tomorrow night. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.